um, welcome to you all to the webinar Natural Butters and Oil in Cosmetics, organized by CBI. My name is Thomas Funk, and I'm working for CBI in the Market Intelligence Team. Uh, as you can read on the screen, we cannot see or hear you, uh, so please ask your questions via the questions pane on your screen. Uh, most questions will be answered during this webinar. Uh, the recording of the presentation will be available on our website in a few days. And at the end of the presentation, you will receive a short survey about this webinar. It will take about two minutes of your time, so uh, please fill it in for us. Uh, before the presenters uh, will start their presentation, I will start a brief introduction to CBI. I'm going to the next slide. Sorry for that. We'll start a brief introduction with CBI. And after that, uh, Iveta uh, Kovakova from Ecovia Intelligence will start the presentation on natural brittles and oils. And we have uh, Mr. Wolfgang Schiller from Sana Bio, uh, who is a European importer, uh, and he will uh, share his story with us. A very warm welcome to Mrs. Schiller. Uh, at the end, we have uh, time for questions and answers. Uh, so I will start a short introduction on CBI. Um, CBI, uh, the mission of CBI is to connect SMEs in developing countries to the European market and thereby contribute to a sustainable and inclusive economic growth. With that mission, we contribute to a sustainable development goal number eight from the United Nations and that is decent work and economic growth. Uh, uh, we are funded by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, of the Netherlands and can start programs in about 30 countries. Here you see the list of countries where CBI has running, running projects uh, and or can start new projects. Uh, we are not active in all countries at the same time. Uh, we invite you to uh, visit our website and uh, read more about uh, CBI. Um, we, uh, uh, CBI offers uh, four-year programs with training sessions and expert co coaching sessions for small and medium-sized enterprises. And we offer a broad range of market studies with information and tips that help you export to Europe. I will now start a short uh, animated video about uh, CBI market information. Uh, let me try if I can get that technically working. So, you are an entrepreneur, you have a great product, and you want to export to European or regional markets. But getting access to good quality market information can be difficult. At CBI, we provide you with the tools to bridge that gap. Through market studies and presentations, we make market information available for SMEs in developing countries, helping entrepreneurs in many different sectors, in agriculture, consumer products and services. The studies answer questions such as which countries offer the most opportunities for your product? What channels should you use to enter the market in your sector? And what laws and requirements must you follow? Our market information is easy to access, full of practical tips and free of charge. Improve your exports now Find out more at cbi.eu slash market info.
Okay, thank you. Uh, that was uh, the information and please visit our website to find more about the studies or all kinds of studies on our website. Um, I will now uh, give the floor to uh, Iveta, uh, who will start her presentation about uh, expert openings in natural oils and natural butters for cosmetics. Well, I'll make you a presenter, Iveta. Thank you. So, uh, can you see my can you see my screen? Hope you can see my presentation. Great. Yes, I can. So yes, thank you very much, uh, Thomas, uh, for the introduction. Uh, so welcome everyone. Um, in my presentation uh, today, I will give an update on the European market for natural butters and oils in uh, cosmetics. So uh, what's on the agenda today? So I will start with an introduction into the topic, and then I will uh, briefly talk about European market for natural butters and oils. I will also talk about market entry guidelines. So what is it that you need to do as an exporter of natural oils and butters in order to increase your chances when exporting to Europe? And I will conclude with a future outlook and um, potential export opportunities for you. So um, I would like to start with briefly introducing our company, Ecovia Intelligence. Uh, we are a market research and consulting company. Uh, and apart from consulting and market intelligence, we also hold um, seminars and workshops. And we also organize our sustainability summits, uh, particularly our sustainable cosmetic summit in major regions all around the world, um, which are now actually held online. Um, and uh, you can find more information about our upcoming editions on our website. So let's start. So uh, vegetable oils and butters, um, they have a wide range of functional and active uh, properties, uh, which is why they are used in uh, cosmetics products. So uh, here are some examples of uh, uh, particular vegetable oils and butters and some of the reasons, uh, some of the functions, uh, what they would actually do in, in, um, as a part of cosmetics product formulation. So for example, avocado oil is used in anti-aging products. Uh, shea butter is used as a moisturizer, uh, also has healing properties and is also used in anti-aging products. And argan oil um, has powerful antioxidant properties and is used in um, uh, skincare products and also in hair care products to impart shine to hair. Um, so how is the market segmented for natural oils and butters? So this really depends on specific um, uh, ingredient. This is an example for mango butter. So we can see that mango butter can be used in different sectors, for example, health products, um, where mango butter is used in healing salves and creams. Uh, it is also used in food sector, um, or for example, in confectionery products. And last but not least, in uh, the personal care sector, where it's used in wide range of skincare products, hair care products, as well as color cosmetics. Um, uh, cosmetics oils um, and butters uh, are also, um, the application is also restricted. Uh, for example, baobab oil can only be used in the cosmetic sector in Europe. Um, this is because of uh, EU regulations. Um, and here the market, in the market is segmented into the conventional sector. Uh, and the organic and certified sector. And uh, we, we also know that, uh, especially when it comes to barba oil, the certified sector is becoming very important as it's seen as a certification is seen, seen as a standard of uh, quality. So what is the demand on the European market um, for natural oils and butters? So this slide Illustrate the, illustrates the European uh, personal care products market. 
we can see that the market has been growing at a, at a subtle single digit um, rate um, in the last years. Um, this is because the market is already saturated. However, um, many conventional personal care companies are now replacing um, synthetic uh, harmful ingredients with natural ones. So this uh, creates opportunity for uh, suppliers of natural oils and butters like you, since uh, there's this general trend where cosmetics companies are moving away from synthetic chemicals towards natural ones. We also expect to see similar growth of the European cosmetics market in the future. So what countries are most prospective? Um, so in terms of the size of the market, um, these are the leading um, uh, cosmetics market in Europe. So we have Germany, France, UK, Italy and Spain. These are traditionally the biggest consumer markets in Europe. Um, these country markets, such as especially Germany and France and Italy, they have a robust processing sector and also a lot of uh, importers are actually located in, this, in these countries. So what is the demand in terms of product categories? So this slide illustrates the breakdown of the European personal care products market uh, into product categories. So we can see that the skincare category is the leading one, um, followed by toiletries, as well as hair care products, um, which is actually good news for suppliers of natural oils and butters because uh, these type of ingredients actually have wide range of applications in these in these product categories. So uh, you can use it to, to your advantage. Um, in terms of natural and organic personal care products um, market in Europe, uh, this market is growing at a higher rate uh, than the conventional one. So we estimate the market to be worth 4.5 billion US dollars, uh, which is still around 4% uh, market share of the conventional one. Uh, but we expect this, this share to grow um, over the forecast period. Uh, certification is very important in Europe, um, the uh, natural and organic cosmetics market in Europe. We estimate that around 55% of the market is actually certified. Um, and major channels are still specialist retailers. However, um, channels such as drugstores and pharmacies are becoming important. So what are the um, important country markets for the natural and organic personal care products? So we can see uh, there's an overlap with the conventional personal care products. So we have Germany, 35%, uh, France, 20%, then Italy, 12%, the UK accounts for 10%. And um, uh, here's the difference. So again, we have Switzerland and Greece. So these countries uh, tend to have uh, consumers that are aware and educated. They look for high quality, environmentally fr uh, friendly products. Um, and also certification, certified products are important for consumers in these countries. So what are the macro trends on the European um, uh, natural oil and butters market? So, First of all, there is a growing importance of ethical uh, and sustainable sourcing and production. Um, there is an increasing importance of ethical certification. Also, aging population in Europe as well as millennials are shaping consumer behavior. And there is also increasing popularity of food-based ingredients in personal care products. And COVID-19 pandemic has shaped the European personal care markets. So I will now talk further about uh, these trends. Um, there's also Brexit. Brexit is also uh, affecting the, the dynamics, the trade dynamics on the market. So with consumers, European consumers becoming uh, more aware, uh, we can see that there is increasing demand for sustainable and traceable sourcing, uh, as well as production of natural ingredients. Um, many suppliers um, of natural ingredients 
are choosing third-party certification schemes that show that they are committed to sustainable and traceable sourcing. Uh, here we have an example of uh, a supplier of Baobab oil that actually supplies um, UVT and Fairwild certified uh, Baobab oil as well as uh, organic uh, Baobab oil. Uh, some of the larger uh, importers, um, they tend to set up their own sourcing projects where they have more control over the supply chain and they can make their own commitments towards um, sustainable and traceable sourcing. Here we have an example of um, uh, Danish Swedish uh, importer of AK of Shia Butter and their um, Colonna Fasa project um, in Ghana. What we also see are uh, uh, industry associations and initiatives being formed. Here we have an example of sustainable co coconut and coconut oil roundtable, which is a very recent initiative um, that um, uh, sort of uh, shows commitment to sustainable and traceable sourcing of coconut and coconut oil. And it's a similar initiative to RSPO, and we expect to see more of these kind of initiatives for specific uh, oils and butters being formed in the future. So increased um, demand or importance of sustainability schemes. So this slide illustrates the growing uh, sort of share of certified raw materials. Um, obviously this pertains to um, some, some food ingredients such as cocoa, coffee, but we also have here, uh, here shown palm oil. We can see that um, the, these ingredients, the share of certified ingredients has been growing um, in the last uh, couple of years quite substantially. And we will see more of this, um, uh, more of this trend in the future. Um, and this can be also applied to, to ingredients for natural ingredients for cosmetics. So in terms of um, aging population and consumer behavior, so with growing uh, share of aging population, um, increasing life expectancy, as well as increasing uh, disposable income, uh, we expect uh, the uh, market segment of anti-aging uh, cosmetics products to grow in Europe according to market data forecast. Uh, the European anti-aging market was worth uh, 14.9 um, billion US dollars in 2020 and it is expected to grow at a compound annual growth rate of more than 5% over the forecast period. And here we can also see the share of aging population in uh, some of the leading, um, leading country markets in, in Europe. And there are also uh, it's a wide range of um, natural oils and butters that are used in, in anti-aging products, including avocado oil, um, marula oil, moringa oil, uh, shea butter uh, can be used in anti-aging products. So this definitely uh, creates an opportunity for, uh, for suppliers of natural oils and butters. So millennials are also shaping the consumer behavior. Uh, according to many studies, uh, millennials are the driving force behind, uh, the, behind sales of, of uh, sustainable products. Uh, we know that they are willing to spend more uh, when it comes to purchasing more environment, environmentally friendly, natural uh, and certified products. And this, will, this share will only grow further as uh, this generation has more disposable income. So there's also a growing uh, popularity of food-based ingredients in cosmetics. So personal care formulators are choosing um, exotic food-based ingredients in their formulations. Um, there are many reasons for this. Um, these kind of ingredients sort of offer a certain sense of novelty to, to uh, European consumers. They also give a sense of naturalness and health, um, and also personal care companies can, can use it uh, for marketing. So here are some examples. For example, the Body Shop, they have a range um, based on food-based ingredients. 
um, another company, Faith in Nature. Um, they also market their products on food-based ingredients. Here's another example of Velada uh, and the pomegranate range, and also conventional uh, brands such as Garnier. They also launched several lines based on food-based ingredients. So the COVID-19 uh, pandemic um, definitely affected the uh, supply chain of natural ingredients in various ways. So in some cases, there were shortages of uh, natural ingredients. There, were, there was also a lot of disruption in supply chains, uh, mainly because of uh, lockdowns and uh, production plant closures. And um, there were also some trends towards or move towards um, the globalization. So some importers and producers of personal care products um, sort of move towards uh, sourcing more locally. Obviously, this is not always possible for all the ingredients, but many uh, producers and importers had to reconsider how to and where to source their, um, their raw materials. So in regards to Brexit, uh, there are many implications on the dynamics of, of trade. So as a raw material supplier, uh, these are just some of, the, um, some of the areas that you need to look at when you're sourcing to and through um, the UK. So there are areas related to supply chains, such as customs and logistics. Uh, then, um, of course, tariffs. Um, then there are some regulatory changes uh, in terms of uh, the breed regulation, um, also legal implication when it comes to contract, intellectual property, as well as trademarks. So obviously, this um, uh, this is changing um, on an ongoing basis. Therefore, it is good that you. Uh, sort of keep um, up to date and um, a very good website is the CTPA website where uh, you can get regular updates and news on this topic. So um, I recommend you to visit this website. Um, so uh, this is an example of a value chain of avocado oil. Obviously, um, the value chain can differ depending on specific um, ingredient, but here we can see that the avocado oil is, um, can be processed in the country of origin, in a developing country, um, but a lot of avocado oil is also processed in, in Europe, as well as uh, New Zealand and North America. Um, the processed avocado oil uh, is then exported either through an agent um, or directly to an import and distributor, um, and then it goes to um, end users, whether it's food, the food sector, and users, end users in the food sector, personal care sector, and health product sector. So uh, I now have a poll question for you. So I would like to ask you. Um, what challenges um, has your business faced uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic? So uh, was it disruption of logistics? Um, were these difficulties in um, maintaining certification schemes? Um, was it increased costs? Um, was it inability to meet new buyers? Or were there other difficulties that you encountered? So I'll leave um, you to, to vote, maybe a few more seconds. Okay, I think maybe we can close the poll now. So I see um, that 48%, 47 um, percent um, of you considered the inability to be to meet new buyers um, the biggest obstacle. Uh, then it was a disruption of logistics. Yes, this is, uh, was very um, big issue for many uh, importers in Europe and also exporters in developing countries. 
than in difficulties in maintaining certification schemes and increased costs, uh, 17%. So, um, so here we will talk about market entry uh, guidelines. So what is it that you need to do in order to increase your chances when exporting to Europe? So there are some um, important topics or areas that you need to look at, and these include compulsory EU regulation that you need to abide by, then uh, quality issues and adulteration, documentation and technical dossiers, uh, trade, so, trade shows, uh, how to choose the right bar, buyer, and professional online presence. So, uh, compulsory EU regulations, so there are mandatory requirements that you need to meet, which includes the EU regulation. So, here, here are some examples of um, uh, the regulations that you need to meet. So, safety and, of cosmetics ingredients, and then you need to meet the the REACH regulation, uh, regulation in regards to labeling and packaging, also legislation that pertains to efficacy claims, and also regulation about biodiversity and species protection. Quality issues and adulteration, uh, which is a very important um, uh, topic, um, especially for uh, EU buyers. So this depends on specific ingredient, but there are some general over, um, general topics or areas that you need to look at. Um, this includes uh, contamination. So you, as a supplier of natural oils and butters, you need to make sure that your natural ingredients are not contaminated. You need to uh, make sure that um, uh, they contain minimal levels of impurities. Um, also, things like storing, they minimize, um, they minimize uh, the risk of uh, your ingredients to get contaminated um, or uh, adulterated. And also, what's very important, what uh, European buyers, buyers look at when it comes to natural oils and butters, is the fatty acid co content. This is specific to each oil and butter, but for example, in regards to uh, mango butter, uh, the steric acid content should be around 35 to 48%, and the oleic acid content should be around 50, 40 to 50%. So, in regards to um, the documentation, this needs to be, you need to have organized technical dossier even before you actually start uh, approaching European buyers. So these are, um, these are an examples of, of documents that need to be part of your technical dossier. So for example, safety data sheet, they contain a product description, classification, hazard identification, and information on the safety measures. And then you have technical data sheets, uh, which uh, also contains product description, product classification, quality analysis, as well as information on application and uh, certificates. And you also have certification of analysis, which contains, contains analytical data from the product delivered, and also contains data mentioned in the technical data sheet, and the pre-shipment sample approved by a buyer, and contractual agreements with the buyer. So, how to choose uh, the right uh, buyer? So, there are different types of buyers on the European market. Um, and uh, you, first, as a supplier of natural ingredients, you need to know um, what you actually can deliver, uh, and then uh, you can approach the right buyers. So, there are large to medium sized buyers um, of, of natural ingredients. So, these type of buyers tend to buy. Sort of wide range of ingredients, uh, including conventional as well as certified. So you should approach this uh, kind of buyers when you apply, when you're able to supply um, larger quantities and potentially a wider range of ingredients. Then you have smaller to medium-sized buyers. Um, this type of, type of buyers tend to focus on specific type of ingredient, ingredients, specific sectors, or for example, certified buyers, certified ingredients. 
and you should approach this type of virus if you supply lower quantities, ingredients, and potentially um, focus on specific or niche ingredients. Then we have large to medium-sized cosmetic companies. So these are com uh, tend to be uh, conventional uh, cosmetics companies that buy directly. Uh, these are the type of companies that um, are replacing or using natural, natural ingredients in their formulations. And you should consider approaching these companies if you're able to supply larger quantities of your um, ingredients. Then we have small to medium-sized natural and organic cosmetics companies. Um, these uh, type of companies um, tend to focus only on natural and organic uh, products. And you should approach these type of companies if you're looking to set up long-term projects and if you are able to supply certified ingredients. And of course, buyers tend to have their own um, sort of requirements. Um, and uh, Mr. Wolfgang Schiller will uh, talk further about these uh, buyer requirements um, a bit later. So, so here's a case study of, an, of a company that has professional online presence. So uh, in this um, um, DNA, it's very important that you actually have professional online presence. Um, this example of the Savannah Fruits Company, uh, we can see that they clearly list their products for, for portfolio on their website. They also list uh, clearly their certifications um, that the products or ingredients actually carry. So we see they have fair trade certification um, as well as uh, several types of organic certification schemes. They also have halal and kosher certification as well as ISO standard. We can also see that they show their commitments to um, sustainable development goals. This is also a great way how to communicate your commitment to sustainability. Um, on their website, you could also see that they use professional photographs, which is very important um, for, for suppliers of raw materials um, to do when they want to present themselves in a professional way. So let's look at future outlook and what we can actually expect. So some of the trends to watch. So um, we can expect a proliferation of eco-labels. Um, then we will see further market segmentation of the European personal care products market. Uh, we will see stricter buyer standards and EU regulations and also implications of the COVID-19 pandemic and how that shaped the European market. So currently there are more than 200 eco-labels present on the market. Um, so these are mainly um, uh, the, the, the big portion or the bulk of them actually come from the food sector. But what we have seen in the last year, we've seen um, this uh, standard actually sort of percolate or enter the cosmetic sector as well. A good example would be the fair trade standard, which started as an agricultural standard. Um, so even though cosmetics companies um, actually want to communicate a very positive message to consumers, uh, this can actually um, uh, this can actually uh, create confusion when it comes to proliferation of labels and also sometimes greenwashing, as uh, as um, there are many self-design labels on the market as well. Uh, but when it comes to standards, some of the most common one common ones when it comes to um, natural oils and butters include um, organic, uh, fair trade, as well as standards that pertain to sustainable sourcing, um, uh, sustainable and ethical sourcing. So market segmentation, this is another trend on the European personal care products market um, that will affect um, natural oils and butters. So what we see on the market is um, um, brands developing products for specific sectors and segments. For example, here we have an example of an anti-aging product. So I talked about, about this 
um, in my previous slides. Um, and another example of anti-pollution products as well as um, um, anti-blue light products. Uh, we will also, we have also seen a market segmentation in terms of specific consumers. So we have uh, lines designed for men care, um, baby care, or consumers that are active, um, um, active in the gym, they go to the gym. So we will see uh, more of this happening um, in the future. And you as a supply of natural oils and butters can, can use this um, as an opportunity for you. So, uh, COVID-19 impact. So, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic um, has affected the European market in various ways. So, uh, first of all, um, there was quite substantial retail disruption. Um, there were many, many uh, specific types of channels, such as salons and spas, had to close down. Um, but on the other hand, we saw the ri rise in uh, online retailing. Um, on the other hand, um, the uh, demand for natural and organic products, including personal care products, has increased. This is mainly because European consumers started looking at uh, the health impacts of the products they buy, they're putting on the skin. Um, and we see uh, this trend to continue further in the future. Um, there was also um, a disruption of decreasing consumer spending power. So many people uh, were put on furlough or lost their jobs. So um, they had to sort of like cease or, or stop spending on, on maybe a bit more like high quality products. Um, and also we saw a change in consumer behavior towards um, specific type of uh, products, for example, soaps and hand sanitizers. Uh, maybe away from color cosmetics where European consumers were uh, maybe not uh, going to, to social occasions that much. So uh, this uh, will definitely have an implication on the European cosmetics market in the future, in the, in the long term. So what are the market opportuni opportunities uh, for you? So um, I already mentioned that Europe is a prospective market for you as a supplier of natural oils and butters mainly because there's an increasing demand for natural ingredients. Many conventional personal care companies are replacing harmful synthetic uh, ingredients with natural ones. Also, also, there is an increasing demand for certified cosmetics, uh, which creates opportunity for you. Um, many macro ingredient strands um, also offer opportunities for natural oils and butters. Um, specifically, the trend um, of um, trend of move towards more food-based and exotic ingredients in personal care products. Um, also, finding buyers is not another opportunity, but you need to make sure that you're export ready, that you abide by the the compulsory uh, EU regulation, that you have organized technical dossier. Um, also COVID-19 impact. So we um, we saw that COVID has affected um, consumer behavior. So consumers moved more towards natural organic products as they're looking at the health impacts of the products that they buy, as well as post-Brexit post UK market could um, present an opportunity. Um, but you have to make sure that you follow all the updates um, on trade agreements. So that's everything from my side. Uh, and now, uh, Mr. Wolfgang Schiller, um, who is a managing director of German importer Sanabio, uh, will give his presentation on the importer perspective. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention, and I look uh, forward for your, uh, to, to your questions. So, can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yes, I can hear you, Mr. Schiller. I will start now my uh, my presentation. So, oh, can you see it? Uh, no, not yet. I not can yet? see only you. 
Ah, only uh, I have to share first my. Uh... Are you a presenter already? Let me I see. I don't know. Uh, that's the problem. That's the problem. Okay. I'll make you a presenter. And now, now you can share your presentation. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can see your presentation. So I assume okay. everybody okay, can. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar. Um, uh, thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Iveta, for your uh, presentations. It was uh, very uh, interesting also for me, um, especially the cosmetics market. Um, um, my wife was the head of development at La Verana Cosmetics uh, until uh, two years ago now. So uh, this is a market uh, which we well know. Um, my name is Wolfgang. I am uh, owner and uh, manager of uh, Sana Bio Company. We are uh, specialized in uh, importing and distributing uh, organic uh, products. Uh, we also do extraction. Uh, we do uh, pressing. We do uh, ultrasonic extraction. Uh, we do distillation. Uh, we have uh, a couple of units uh, in Europe uh, who are working uh, together. Um, I wanted to present you the um, um, business, the import business uh, from the view of an importer. So um, the most important thing is to reduce the risk for your customers. And uh, this you can do when you offer them good payment conditions, good delivery conditions, and when you are a certified uh, company. In organic sector, certification must be. Payment conditions. Uh, the most of the contacts uh, we have with uh, um, companies who want to sell to the European uh, market, uh, they would like to have uh, payment um, in advance. This is something we cannot do. You must understand that your customers, they don't want to support the financial risk and the quality risk of the business only themselves. So you have to find possibilities to reduce the financial risk and the quality risk for your customers. Uh, the prices that you offer, they have to be the result of a economic calculation. You don't, you should not try to find out uh, what the market price is in, 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 in Europe or in Germany, uh, and then uh, try to get in with this price to the market. Your customers are well trained. They have a high level of education and they can calculate. They know how high are the salaries in your countries. They know how, are, how high are the costs in your countries and they can calculate. So prices should be the result of a economic calculation. If you want to do speculations, you can do it on the commodity exchange. Uh, you should allow payment targets, even if there is a potential risk for you. With advanced payments, it is nearly impossible to do business in the European market. Payment targets are necessary because the importers, your customers, 
they need time for quality controls. Um, we have a lot of legislations uh, and 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 um, high uh, quality needs, high legal quality needs in Germany. So we need time to do the quality control. Delivery conditions. The usual delivery conditions are a DDP, CFR, uh, FOB, other um, cash insurance freight. Uh, Together with your customers or with your potential customers, you should find out what is the best delivery conditions for them. And um, you should try to offer them these delivery conditions. I know DDP is very um, hard for you to realize, uh, uh, to do DDP delivery. You have to be uh, a customs registered in, in Europe and that is, um, uh, something that it's um, nearly impossible for you to do but there is still ddu cfr fob and cif as delivery conditions um, you should make the handling with your goods easy for your customers so the emballage should comply with European standards. Um, you should use standard containers like IBCs, drums, cans. You should pelletize the goods. Uh, don't fill bags floor loaded in containers. Uh, it's very hard for an importer to handle this. Um, we have high costs for our employees and uh, to unload a container who is floor loaded, um, it, it costs more than a few cents per, ki per kg, uh, which uh, your importer has to pay more for the goods uh, and you deliver him uh, the goods uh, pelletized. Every handling should be uh, made by machine, even unloading. Certifications. Um, certifications are reducing the quality risk for your customers. If you are a certified, a certified company, uh, if you have an organic certification, ISO 9001, good manufacturing practice, uh, EFS or something similar, um, this in is increasing the trust of your customers in the quality of your products. Below the certifications, you have to have the accompanying documents ready to send, like technical data sheet, um, safety data sheet, safety data sheet only for non-food products. Don't make the, dis the mistake and send a potential customer a safety data sheet for a food product because if you do so this product becomes a non-food legislation is very clear in this point um, send everything you have about the product technical data sheets specifications certificates of analysis and send samples if your customer requires them. The samples should be correctly labeled, including the lot number of the lot that is reserved for your, cost, for your customer. When your customer, when an importer is receiving samples, he is doing a analysis on a certificate in a certificate lab laboratory in the certificate of analysis there is the lot number written the lot number of the sample when he re receives the goods and the goods have another lot number as the sample 
he has to reject the goods. So this is very important. Sampling only with a lot number and the goods who are delivered should have the same lot number as the samples itself. Thank you for our attention. Have a nice day. So this was my presentation. Who's next? Thank you, uh, Mr. Schiller. That was uh, very good to hear. Um, I think we'll now go to uh, to the questions. Uh, there were a lot of questions, and uh, so I'll. Uh, the, some of the questions are for Iveta. Some of the questions are are, are probably for you, uh, Mr. Schiller. Um, so. Okay, I go to the to the questions, and maybe the first question uh, probably for Iveta, but if uh, Mr. Schiller has something to add on that, please do. Uh, we got a, a couple of questions on the potential for uh, for oils and butters, which were not specifically mentioned in this uh, presentation. So um, there were questions about the European market for. Uh, Tamanu oil, for cashew oil, and for nutmeg oil, and also for thyme essential oil. Can anyone say if, if uh, Iveta or Mrs. Sheila, if there is a market for uh, for these kind of oils as well? Maybe maybe yeah. I can start. Yeah, okay, I can start. Okay, and then... Iveta, you can start. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the feedback from the industry is that. Um, um, even though the the the, uh, the popularity of uh, exotic food-based in, ingredients is is there and is increasing, there's also uh, like a, very often the popularity shifts from one oil to uh, another. So um, at the moment, um, the um, the um, the oils that were listed. Um, they're not as known uh, among European consumers, but there could potentially be a market for them in the future. This also depends on um, um, on uh, formulators, like how because uh, formulators are familiar with certain types of um, of butters and oils, they know how they can incorporate them into products. So they will they're more likely to go for, for example, shea butter. Um, as it's, it's uh, the, the supply chain is already established, uh, European consumers are familiar with it. Then, uh, for example, some of the the newer oils. But again, this also de depends on the um, on, on the buyers. So when buyers get certain um, oil on the market, they uh, very often sort of invest in the marketing and telling like how good they actually um, uh, in marketing um, this new. Up and coming ingredients. Okay, thank you, Veta. Uh, Mr. Shira, anything to add on that? Or... Um, yes, there is a market for any kind of raw material uh, in Europe. Um, in the last uh, 30 years, every uh, increase of the uh, cosmetics market was started with a new ingredient, with a new innovative ingredient. It was in the 80s, it was aloe vera. Uh, in the 90s, it was argan oil and a couple of others, okay? Um, and uh, Iveta uh, told us that there is a higher seg segmentation in the market. So uh, these two things go together, okay? Uh, you have uh, uh, new innovative ingredients who are a solution for a specific problem, okay? Um, making skin uh, lighter or deeper or uh, uh, darker or uh, reducing some riddles or I don't know, okay? So <laughs> there, is, there is a market for any kind of uh, raw material. Yeah? Uh, and when it is organic certified, it, it's easier to get in to the market. Okay, yeah? thank you. Clear answer. Um, maybe this, the, the next question is... is uh, uh, is a bit a part of that answer as well. 
uh, because the question is, uh, when we talk about anti-aging ingredients, what is the main indicator uh, that certain oils or butters are better than others? Yeah. Maybe that's the question um, for you, Mr. Schiller. <laughs> yes. Um, so, um, in, uh, in, in Europe and in Germany, uh, we have a, uh, a law, a legislation, which uh, it is not allowed to uh, give a product some, um, some characteristics which it does not have. So uh, every producer of cosmetics, he has to do a study for his products and prove through this study that this specific product is, has an anti-aging effect. This study can be done also for raw materials, but it, this is the part of the work of the importer who is going to develop the market for this raw material which is importing. Yeah? So this is our part of work. Okay, we take the product, we read the specification of, uh, uh, from our uh, supplier, and then we start to do our homework. Yeah? We start to do our tests, we uh, start to work with external uh, laboratories together, we uh, are doing a, a, a study about a specific effect, and if the study uh, uh, shows us that it has this effect, we can sell it to the cosmetic market with this specific effect. Yeah. Okay. And so the it's, uh... cosmetic producer can do the declaration on his product. It is anti-aging or it reduces riddles or because the main ingredient is this oil or this fat. Okay, thank you. So it's important to find a, a good importer which you can work uh, close together. Um, next question um, is, uh, what is the minimum quantity required by the buyer per shipment, for example, for mango butter? So is there by, a minimum by a quantity? By specific buyer or generally? Uh, generally. Generally, I don't know how the requirements are for other buyers, but we, mango butter, one container. One container for you, uh, for, for Santa yeah. Bio, uh, it, it will be one container as a minimum uh, quantity to, 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 to for delivery. Okay, yeah. clear. Um, and, okay. Um, Here's a, a question about uh, certification and labelization. Uh, can an African foreign company get European certification and labelization for essential oils easily from the, his country? If not, how can he do that? Okay. Um, what kind of certification? Organic certification? Let's assume that. Sorry? Uh, yeah, let's assume a organic certification. Organic certification. Organic certification. Um, there is the organic le legislation available online. as a European database of the European Commission, and there is the organic legislation available in uh, English language or in, in, in a lot of languages. Uh, and in the annex in this uh, law, uh, you can find um, all um, certification bodies which uh, can work in your country and uh, the exporter has to contact one of these certification bodies and they will tell him what he has to do but organic certification is uh, available all over the world and it can be, can be done uh, in every country Okay, and is that on the on the website of the Euro European Union? Is it from yes. market uh, market to access? It's free to access. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, 
And uh, next question. Um, also about certification. Does certification uh, will be able to increase our product prices economically? So if you have certification, do you get a higher price for your product? Yes. Yes, it's, it's not, it's not, not only you get a higher price, you can sell your products in euro. So that is the point. Okay, without certifications, it is uh, something about believing. Yes, but uh, German government is asking from me to know, not to believe. So I have to know that the products that I am importing are reliable and uh, are uh, no danger for the consumer in Germany and in, in, in Europe. Yeah, so I must be sure before I start business. <laughs> yes, yes, clear. Um, another question on quality. How important are quality and hygiene standards for cosmetic products, for example, for she better? Very important. Cosmetic European cosmetic legislations legislation is uh, is uh, um, asking for GMP standard. Every cosmetic producer must have GMP standard. And now governments, especially, especially uh, German government, is starting to ask for a GMP standard for the whole supply chain, not only for the last production unit before consumer, you know? Yes. So the whole supply chain has to be GMP certified. Today, this is not a must, but government, I, we, we, can, we can feel the influence and that they are trying to, to maneuverate us in this direction. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, uh, a question, is there still possibilities if we wanted to introduce new exotic butters to the markets? Um, yeah, uh, I yes, think you already sure. said and there's always a market for new products. And so, yes. yeah, the, I think the, cosmetic market, that. the cosmetic market is living from innovation. So this is their... Uh, uh, their business uh, uh, scheme. Yeah. So then there's a question: um, How does an, a small medium enterprise introduce a novel oil uh, to the European market? So what's the route to take when you have a new oil? Find an importer, yes. and everything yeah. else. Everything else is his duty. Pierre, yeah, maybe I can I can add. Um, I think it's very important if, if it's like a novel uh, ingredient. Um, it's very important to also build awareness. Um, so um, it's it's good to have some kind of uh, scientific data as to what kind of uh, functional and active properties your oil have, which is uh, uh, very important when you sort of like go to a trade show, you meet a buyer and you want to introduce this completely new ingredient and you want to convince them that it's actually uh, worth it, uh, it's, it's worth it for them to take on, um, take this ingredient on board and then do the necessary marketing um, um, uh, for the ingredient to be successful on the European market. So I think the suppliers um, of uh, novel uh, oils and butters, they need to do some preparation work before um, um, and also awareness building is the, is the key because there are so many already established oils uh, where formulators are already familiar with them. So um, this is very important as well. Okay. Um. Let me see if there are more. There, uh, okay, we still okay. We are we are good on time. We still have <clears throat> about ten minutes for um, questions. Um, another question for Mr. Schiller. Um, 
oh, this is very specific. How can we connect with your company to be your potential Shea supplier? Uh, so uh, our, yeah, there's, there's like- Sanabio, Sanabio.bio. So they can uh, they can contact you via via, uh, via your website. Is that what you yes. are telling, Mr. Schiller? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, and here is a, a question. Maybe Iveta can answer. It. What's the difference between mango butter and mango puree? So. Um, Mango puree um, is um, um, it comes from um, the fruit, uh, the flesh of the uh, of the uh, of the fruit, um, and mango butter is actually uh, processed from the kernel uh, of mango. Um, so yeah, these are very different products uh, with different applications and that go through um, uh, different processing um, process. So yeah. Mango puree is a food. Yes. Uh, mango was a fruit which was known, well known on the European market before 1990. So it, it, it doesn't have to do a novel food uh, uh, certification. Okay. Uh, mango butter is a product which is new. It, it was not known before 1990 on the European market to sell it as a food product you have to do a novel food certification. Nobody did it until now, so that is why mango butter is considered to be a non-food, a cosmetic ingredient. Okay, thank you. Um, here a question um, about mango, moringa oil. How is moringa oil trend in Europe? Is it popular there? Are there many demands for moringa oil? I think Maybe I, I can... think it is, but please, experts, yeah. tell me. Uh, yes, moringa is definitely um, uh, becoming popular uh, on on the European market. Uh, whether it's the moringa powder or moringa oil, um, um, yeah. So there is definitely an up and coming uh, demand. Uh, the awareness of consumers is also growing growing in, in regards to moringa in countries such as uh, Germany. Uh, France and, and the UK. Okay. Mm, okay, already. Just scrolling to the quest through the questions. Okay. Uh, I'll answer that later. Some people are asking for the for the link to the organic uh, certification uh, bodies where they can find that. Uh, it's, it's, it is in some of our studies. So uh, again, please visit our website and check the studies we have on bio requirements. And there we also talk about uh, certification. Uh, for example, the Natru certification. I see questions about that as well. Uh, and uh, somebody is asking, we have a certification from Nature, but I don't see it in a recommendation. Can you tell something about it, Iveta? Sorry, is it a certification from Nature? Yes. She, uh, the, the person who asked a question uh, uh -huh. says, uh, I have, we have a certification from Nature, but I do, do not see it in a recommendation. Um, I think in, in, the, in the presentations, I think, um, yes, so there are, um, so for example, um, there are the EU organic uh, standard, that's an agricultural standard um, um, that can be used for, for raw materials, uh, regardless of what, what kind of sector um, they end up being used in. Uh, well, whereas the Natru actually is um, a standard for cosmetics products, and um, um, so um, 
it is not um i mean the eu EU organic standard is a sort of uh, more common because it covers agricultural commodities as well. But uh, yeah, definitely natural. Uh, a lot of um, European importers are familiar with the natural standard and um, is not in any way inferior to the EU organic standard. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, we have yeah, we have a lot of uh, questions about all kind of different oils in the market uh, perspective for it, uh, and I see here a question for for uh, for turmeric and ginger oil. Um, I know we have uh, uh, we have a study on the website on turmeric. Um, and also, uh, what, what Mr. Schiller previous said, there's a market for every oil, but you have to find an importer who uh, will work with you on that. Um, yeah, we have turmeric oil in our product range. Okay, that's good to know. So we know the product. And ginger oil as well, Mr. Schiller? Ginger oil as well, yes. Yes, so... There's also a market for those products. And a special question for uh, Iveta. Uh, uh, can you give a, detail, uh, a detailed market exposure for coconut products, especially for cosmetics? Um, sorry, I don't understand market exposure. What does it mean? Um, like... Market exposure, uh, the, I think he means the trends. Uh, for coconut, coconut oil products for in cosmetics. cosmetics. Uh, yes, I mean uh, this has definitely been a trend in Europe in the in the last couple of years. Whether it's uh, coconut oil as an ingredient uh, in uh, cosmetics products or uh, raw virgin coconut oil being used um, um, as a as a as a cosmetic product. So uh, definitely, European consumers are familiar with coconut oil. Has been um um has been um sort of uh, used whether it's food or cosmetics uh in the last couple of years so um this is definitely um a lot of potential there and opportunity okay thank you um then i had a question someone's asking what is gmp good manufacturing practice and that's a requirement, right? Yes, it's a legal requirement uh, in the cosmetic legislation. Okay. Um, What are, and there's a question here about what are the main suppliers of mango butter to the European market at the moment? So uh, I, I think uh, it means the, which countries are the, at this moment the main suppliers of mango butter to, to Europe? Um, maybe I can say, I think um, uh, in principle, um, these are the um, Producers of uh, mangoes, so I think in the, India is definitely uh, um, very high on the list. But also, a mango butter um, uh, very often is sort of the processing take, takes place in um, in uh, in Europe and uh, North America as well. Because I know, for example, Halstar is also a big processor of uh, and producer of mango butter. So um, yeah, a lot of these oils uh, and butters um, they are process uh, both in in the country of origin but also uh in the importing country as well okay thank you uh so um yeah i see uh, a, a question also about the uh, uh, market for avocado oil and and let me tell you that we have just uh and ecovia intelligence have just finished uh, the study of especially on avocado oil so uh, that study will be on our website in, in about uh, three to four weeks. 
Uh, so you can then there you can read specifically on avocado oil what the uh, what the market is. And also we ha already have a study on mango butter on our website. So please check that as well. Uh, um, and now we're at the end of uh, of our session. Uh, I think most of the questions were answered, but uh, unfortunately not all. Um, and um, yeah, we'll uh, put this presentation on our website soon. So we're gonna uh, close it for today. But uh, please, uh, you will receive a, a short survey about this webinar. So uh, please uh, fill it in for us, so we know what you think of this webinar, and we can do even better next time, maybe. Uh, I'll special thanks for Iveta for giving the presentation and also for Mrs. Schiller as a, as a, as a guest uh, presenter. Uh, I think it's for our audience, uh, it's always uh, very uh, interesting to her uh, an importer talk about uh, his experiences and his uh, requirements when doing business with suppliers. So uh, very, thank you very much, Mrs. Schiller. You are welcome. Thank you. And thank you thank all you. for joining us. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.